thank you, Lord, for your changing power. That the mark of your blood and of the crucifixion is transformation. Bless us to hear and receive from your word. We thank you, Lord God. Thank you that you loved us enough to send your son. Thank you for choosing us to experience such a great salvation. We love you today. Bless now this moment of preached word that people might be edified and inspired. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you. Would you clap your hands one more time to celebrate being changed? Here's what we're going to do. I want you to go to the book of Matthew, the book of Matthew, the third chapter, the third chapter. First of all, can we praise God for our senior pastor, Bishop Virgil Patterson? Bishop. I, I said our senior pastor, not the guy who fries your fish. I said, would you praise God for our senior pastor, Bishop Virgil Patterson. Keep that same energy for his incredible wife, Pastor Jerry Patterson. Um, that's what I'm talking about. Uh, we bless the name of the Lord. Um, will you pray for me today? This is totally plan B. I'm going to let you a little bit behind the curtain. Uh, we were supposed to hear the voice of our bishop today. Um, we're continuing to pray his strength. When I heard him saying, I almost said, oh, no, pull up that other table, sir. <laughs> you felt your help come. Now come on and help. Huh? But we honor the Lord, and uh, that's certainly our function and my function in this space is to hold up his arms. And so when he needs a minute, it's my honor to provide. And I trust that in this space, although it is our plan B, we had other plans, certainly was excited for what the Lord was going to share through him. Um, I won't touch that because I really think at another date you need to hear that. We had talked a little bit about where the Lord was leading him. And so um, I will allow him to come and not allow. I will make space um, and by not preaching that particular text. I'm going to go a different way. Um, and in the leading of the Lord, I believe that though it was our plan B, I think that God knew this was going to happen uh, to preach this morning before arriving here. And so I'm trusting that God would just fill the rest of whatever he wants to say. Uh, if the Hudson family is watching, shout out to Brene who graduated yesterday. If you're watching, we love you and celebrate you and all our folks who are graduating in school, pursuing school. And that's not just young folks in school. That's folks who are continued on their journeys, valuing education. Would you just wave at me if you're working on anything, a certificate, another degree, a program? I see your hands. I see your hands. I love you. And we are praying for you. We're celebrating you. Please let Bishop and Pastor Jerry know um, when you've completed whatever that is so that we can celebrate you adequately because it's a great thing when... Uh, people of the Lord continue in their education. It is my assignment to preach the last Sunday of, of every month for Refreshing Sunday. And so since I will come back next week, I, I want to begin a two-part discussion, if you will, that I'm calling game-changing conversations. Game-changing conversations. There are sermons that you deliver in ministry that are for seasons. There are sermons at times that the Lord gives you for seasonal discussion. It is oftentimes what we refer to theologically as what's called a rhema word. It means that somehow God is able to take logos, Greek for same word, similar word, a word which we can approach as the written word of God already, or a word that we'll all hear as a group together. 
But he's able to take that logos, that word that's already been written, that scripture everybody's read, or the logos, the same word, the word that we will hear together, and he's able to make it rhema. He's able to make it specific for you. We just lift your hands even then and say, Lord, give me rhema. Give me something specific. There are times where the preach word happens in that way. And then there are other preaching times where you share something that will become a part of your life's purpose. It might even become the seminal message by which you are defined. Bishop has now preached thousands upon hundreds of thousands of messages. I believe as we survey the catalog of the library of what he has presented to us theologically, we will detect that there were certain themes that continued to emerge that would suggest that that's what he was sent here to teach us. Understanding the role of faith. Understanding the function of grace in salvation. Understanding the power of our words. There are themes that emerge in Bishop's work. Same for Pastor Jerry. Preached thousands upon thousands of messages, and yet a theme that will consistently emerge is the understanding of the work of Jesus Christ in our lives that should lead us to be different. That yes, blessing is good. Yes, personal development is good. Yes, it's good for you to have all those things, but you better live right. It is important to understand how the word and power of God transforms your living. I've not lived long enough to know this yet, but I have a feeling I will spend the greater majority of my life sharing more and learning more about what I'm going to talk to you about today and next week. Matthew chapter 3. Verse 13, then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John said, nah, fam, ain't nobody about to baptize you. Do you know who you is? Y'all don't have that version? I have need to be baptized of thee, and yet you come to me. And Jesus, answering, said unto him, Suffer it to be so, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. So then John the Baptist said, Well, since you want to be all poetic about it, fine, I'll baptize you. Verse 16, here it is. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, God, God's self interrupts this moment to say something. Jesus is doing what Jesus is supposed to do. But the moment isn't over until God says something. For some reason, God does not feel content to simply watch this event happen from heaven. He has watched years and years as Israel has navigated their way. He has watched for millennia as the humanity that he formed has tried to understand what it means to have a God. He, he has watched thing after thing and moment after moment. He has dealt with prophet after prophet. But this event he cannot simply watch. 
Jesus has interacted with John the Baptist. He's gone down in the water. He has emerged. He's had this experience with John the Baptist. And God the Father says it's not over until I say something. And here's what he says. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Game Changing Conversations, part one. I'm going to talk to you about the power of a man's words. Game Changing Conversations, part one. I want to highlight the power of a man's words. Many of us, when asked why we are the way we are and how we got to this point in life, many of us can tie so much of our experience, our emotions, our identity, or our patterns to either the silence or the words of a man somewhere in our lives. If we're honest, there's some moment in our lives where a man was silent when he should have said something or said something when he should have been silent. And the impact of that decision has lingered over us years after. Can we go on this journey today? Jesus has lived the way he was supposed to up to age 30, which is where we begin to identify this as the start of Jesus' ministry. Many theologians would identify this baptism, hear me, as the public announcement of that ministry. Jesus has been following the call of the father upon his life since he was a kid. You know, he was the one who told his mother, hey, listen, I'm going to be about my father's business. Some of y'all, in true black mom fashion, would have backhanded Jesus. Like, boy, your business is these dishes. I was joking with my mom this week. And uh, we loved to, to joke and have fun. And I, I, I called her something jokingly. I don't remember where it started. And we laughed. And she said, don't call me that. And we laughed some more. And I said, I'm going to call you woman like Jesus. Oh, no, let me, let me pick this up. Let me tell you how this started. I was making a joke. And I said, that's all right, daughter. Because that's what the old pastors I grew up around, like all the women used to church used to be daughter. That's all right, daughter. So I made that joke. And she said, I ain't one of your little church members. <laughs> to which I responded, I said, okay, well, I'm going to call you woman like Jesus called his mother. He said, woman. She said, and yeah, and you didn't hear no more from Jesus until he was 30. <laughs> so I want it on record. If I go missing crusade for the next three years, you'll know. Because I called a black mother woman instead of mom. Jesus says to his mom, he says, I must be about my father's business. So it, ministry, I believe, mm, can I pivot here? Ministry doesn't begin when you're public. Ministry begins in your private experience with God. Okay. This sermon doesn't happen here. That'd be nice. I wish that was the case. Sermon happens in your alone time with God. So, so ministry's hasn't started at this baptism, but theologically we believe that this is the beginning of public ministry. And so it tells me a lot about what God felt like needed to be at the start of Jesus' ministry. The first is we need to see Jesus, add this to your notes, we need to see Jesus start in humility. All great public ministry starts in humility. Jesus will have the rest of his life to be the guy, to be exalted, to be the one. But he starts in humility. John the Baptist says, you're greater than me. 
in stature. You're greater than me as it relates to this whole story. You are God in flesh. I know who I am and I know who you are because we've been rocking since the womb. He says, I don't deserve to baptize you. Jesus says, no, 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 no. It's not about that. It is about me being humble. Watch this. Because I am going to prioritize the order in which this needs to happen over my ego. When was the last time you were more concerned about the story panning out the right way than you were how you were represented in the story? Can I ask that again, Crusade? When was the last time you were more concerned about the story happening rightly than you were about how you're represented in the story? Do you always have to be right? Or do you want the outcome to be healthy? Do you always have to go front row or do you want the team to succeed? Do you always have to get the credit or do you want those who were around you to believe and know that they were a part of something? The beginning of all great public ministry, hear me, is not gifting, it's humility. Because God can do more with a humble person than God can with a talented one. I said, God can do more with a humble person than God can a talented one. So what I think is fascinating is the beginning of Jesus' public ministry, it must begin in, humi in humility. Second of all, it must begin with Jesus acknowledging himself as a part of the story, not as a new story. Can I say that again? It's interesting to me that Jesus identifies himself as being a part of the story. John the Baptist, look, what you do and what I do go together. It's not for me to say, hey, I'm on the scene now. It's a party. Let's get it. No, I'm here because what you do and what I do function together. So first of all, it begins with humility. Second of all, write this word down, public ministry begins in community. There is no Princeton Parker without Elder James Starr Jr., who is someone who has the anointing, who has lived right before God, and was able to see and affirm what God had put in me. He then had a conversation with my parents to say, this is on him, and this is what you will need to know to raise him. And then God would send dozens upon dozens upon hundreds of people who would come alongside me and pour into me and also confirm this idea we have as millennials and the generation after that our stories are best when we prove we did it by ourselves are going to leave us broken. Because God always works in community. I'm going to say it again because we don't like that. God always works in community. So it begins with humility. Second of all, it begins with Jesus understanding that he is a part of a story that is continuing. Third of all, it is about Jesus being in community. He understands that he's part of a story. So John the Baptist says, fine, I'm going to baptize you. But what's amazing to me is all those things being considered. God says, I'm not going to send my son out before I've publicly affirmed him. This wrecked me. That God said, no, watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this. God says, I'm going to affirm him even though he already know how I feel about him. You know how some of us are. You know I love you. These bills say I love you. That purse you wear says, I love you. That trip we went on, so you know who we are. God the Father and God the Son have existed in perfect harmony since the beginning began and before the beginning began in so much as to say that Genesis begins with let us, that there is a communal creation, the triune God within God self creates. The fellowship has been unbroken. If anybody knows how anybody feels, God the Son knows how God the Father feels and yet God the Father says I'm not going to let that keep me from publicly expressing how I feel about you 
God thought it was that important. He says, number one, you need to hear it. And number two, you need to hear it publicly. So team, I interrogated this and I want to know why? Why does God think it necessary to affirm Jesus before he gets into ministry? Why? Why does God say, you got baptized, but that's not the end of the show. I need to have an appearance, and I need to say something to you. Here's why I want you to add this. I think God spoke this over Jesus for a few reasons. Number one, he spoke this so that Jesus would know that he was loved before he did anything. The question of every child to every parent is, do you love me just because? The question of spouses to spouses is, do you love me just because? Or do you only love me because this is my weight? Or do you only love me because we did those fun things back in the day? Or do you only love me because when I get good grades, that makes you look good? Do you only love me because I was your spotless child and I've lived out the dreams you couldn't live? Every person is dying to know, do you love me, period? Or do you love me on the other side of a because? And many of us... Go from drug to drug, relationship to relationship, business to business, ministry to ministry, house to house, because we're dying to know, does anyone or anything love me just because? And for some of us, we only heard the voices of our parents or you've only heard the voice of your significant other when you've done something wrong. And for some of us, it was the reverse. Where when you did well, it was like you were the best thing ever. And when you did wrong, because some of the people closest to us didn't know how to process those emotions, they just paid us the silent treatment. And so we grew up never understanding a love that wasn't based on a condition. And God the Father sets up God the Son and says, you're about to go to fulfill the scripture. But I don't love you because you fulfill scripture. I love you because you're mine. Jesus. I don't love you because you're going to die on Calvary. I love you because you were mine before any of this even mattered. In fact, you and I were who we were even before there was a humanity to die for. And I need you to know. Before you go out here, everything you're going to do, I'm with you. I sent you to do it, but that's not why I love you. I'm well pleased with you before anything happens. The first reason why he had to affirm Jesus was so that Jesus would know that their relationship was not based upon Jesus being the Savior. Here we go. Jesus was not the Savior so that God the Father would love him. Jesus was the Savior because God already loved him. Can I say it again? Jesus was not the Savior so that God the Father would love him. If that was the case, then Jesus could not be the Savior because at that point, everything he's doing is performative. He can't die for you trying to earn affection from him. Because at that point, the motive is not honest. The reason why Jesus is able to do what he's able to do for you and for me is because he's already full from him. Number one, he has to affirm him publicly because I, I need you to know I rock with you. Number two, God the Father speaks us over God the Son to announce to the world his relationship to Jesus. I need all these people around here to know that when they mess with you, they mess with me. And they gonna still mess with you. It's a part of the plan that they mess with you. But they gonna know. Uh, this is <laughs> there's this fantastic TikTok. I should have pulled it up to play it. 
And uh, one of them is, is a lady, I think she's holding like her daughter, and she's like, when you see me, you see her. When you see her, you see me. Jesus says that. He says, when you've looked at me, you've seen the Father. That's how in sync we are. And God says, I need it to be known publicly, our relationship. They can question you and your authenticity as much as they want. But I'm going to go on record to say they better not question this. And if they do, it will be because of their unbelief, not because I didn't speak up. Three, he speaks over Jesus to secure his identity. He reminds Jesus, not just that he's loved before he does anything, but he reminds Jesus, you're my son. And because of that, you have the ability to do everything you're supposed to do. Do you know what kind of confidence you have when you know you belong somewhere? Do you know what belonging does to your psyche? I remember the first time I went to a club. Don't get tight on me. Y'all ain't been to the club? Okay. All right. I was tired of being sanctified, if we're being honest. I was just like, boring, man. I want to be cool like everybody else. And everybody seems to have a ton of fun in the club. And I went and was scared to death. Because I didn't belong in the club. But when I walk into folks' churches... I don't be even asking no directions. I be in places I ain't never been before, and I be like, that look like the way I'm going over there. I be all by the instruments looking at, what a nice way y'all built that pulpit. That is so fantastic. Because the feeling of belonging in a space, in a position, in a family, in a relationship, the feeling of belonging gives you a confidence, watch me, that will help you do what you were sent to do. It is possible to be talented but not produce because you don't feel like you belong. There have been moments in my life, particularly in business, where I struggled not because I couldn't do it but because I felt like I didn't belong there. And I'll never forget the day my boss said, Princeton, it's not that you're not good at being a manager, it's that you think you're not. So because you don't feel like you belong here, you'll always underperform when all of us know you have the capacity to be just as good, if not better than your counterparts. He said, but at this point, I can't do anything else to help you feel like you belong. You have to believe that. And I realize that it's not about talent, it's about belonging. When God says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, that gives him a confidence to now do everything that the son must do, including die. With Jesus, you better get out of his way. Because he say this all the time, I will pray to the father, and then he'd be like, shum, 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 shum. That contact, that unbroken relationship makes Jesus dangerous. That's why he walks up to a man that's dead. It's not simply in his own strength. It is in his understanding of his relationship to the father. And he'd be like, death, you ain't nothing. Me and my daddy got this. He has to secure Jesus' identity. I'm going somewhere. Are you with me this morning, Crusade? He has to secure his identity because there are five voices. Add these to your notes. Nope, seven. There are seven voices that will be at work in Jesus' life. Seven voices that Jesus will hear over the course of time. The first voice he will hear are voices of his family. Voices of his family. That's number one. Family is number one. 
Remember in the Bible, they said, you Joseph's son. Ain't this Joseph's son, the carpenter? Ain't you from Nazareth? Those voices that question whether or not he could actually be effective because of where he was from and who he belonged to. Family. Second of all, he will hear the voice of his disciples. Some days they love him. Some days the disciples be tripping. Some days he's got Peter, who's like, thou art the Christ, the son of living God. And Jesus is like, you get me. And then other days he can't find him. Or he dies and the same Peter who realized who he was says, I never knew him. He will hear the voice of his supporters. He will hear them cry, Hosanna. He will hear his supporters say, truly this was the son of God. He will hear his supporters say uh, that thou, thou art the Christ. He will hear his supporters believe in who he was, that say, surely this was a man of God. He will hear his supporters call him rabbi or teacher. He will hear his supporters call him Messiah. But number four, he will also hear his critics. He'll hear them call him a drunkard because he drunk wine with sinners. He will hear them say that he was full of the devil because the devil was the only way he could do those works. He will hear people call him a liar. He will hear rumblings of how they're plotting to kill him. And some of us can't even stand when somebody don't say good morning. <laughs> he will hear his critics and hear them frequently. Number five, he will hear the voice of the devil. In fact, one of the most powerful things about this text is that the very next voice that Jesus hears after his father's is the voice of Satan. Number six, Jesus will have to wrestle with his own voice. What do you do when the back and forth is not about what they said? What do you do when you've struggled so much with what they said or what they haven't said that now you can't even tell what's their voice and what's yours? Have you ever laid in the bed and said, I just wish it would stop? I just wish the voices would stop but because now they sound like my own voice I'm starting to think I should just give in and believe it but the last voice that he must listen to is the first voice that spoke godly I'm going somewhere I promise give me just a few more minutes he has to make sure that the final voice that influences his decision is the first voice that spoke. So number seven is the voice of his father. Why? Because after he's heard the other six voices, he has to remind himself that those voices don't matter as much as the original voice. And sometimes when I'm looking at the things I don't believe about myself, sometimes when I'm looking at the people who haven't said what I want them to say, sometimes when I'm looking at people who do say what I want them to say, you know what I have to remind myself? I have to say, Princeton, remember that God said it first. God said who you were first. God said what you were supposed to do first. God said that he believed in you first. So whether or not you do, it might impact me, but it does not have the final say because God said it first. I just want to know, is there half a believer in this place that realizes that yes I've cried some tears over what people did or did not say but what has kept me is that I can look up to heaven and say you spoke over me and I believe that what you said matters more than what they do or don't say somebody shout he said it first he called me loved first he said I was he said I was a preacher first 
That's why I've got to look at myself and say, Princeton, even you a liar sometimes. You better not take what the people have said. You better not take what that insecurity says. You better look yourself in the mirror and say, thus saith the Lord. It is written that I am the head and not the tail. It is written that I'm the lender and not the borrower. It is written that I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. It is written that I am the beloved of God. It is the written that I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. It is written that I am fearfully and wonderfully made. It is written that he handpicked and chose me. It's written that I am a royal priesthood. It's written that I am a chosen generation. It's written that the Lord has sanctified me. It is written that before the Lord formed me in my mother's womb, he knew me and he sanctified me as a prophet to the nations. It is written that he knows the plans and the thoughts that he thinks toward me. It is written that I am the light of the world and I am the salt of the earth. Somebody shout it is written. He said it first. He said it first. And it is the fact that he said it first that helps me navigate what people do and don't say. Now let me turn the corner so I can get us out of here. I believe that he writes or that God the Father has publicly affirms God the Son so that Jesus always has something to measure everybody else's words by. When you don't know what God has said about you, you live at the mercy of what people do or don't say. And I'm not saying that it doesn't hurt. What I'm saying is it cannot have the final say over how you view yourself and over whether or not you will be obedient to the calling of God on your life. Last reason. I believe God the Father speaks over Jesus the Son because he has to pour into Jesus what he expects Jesus to pour out. Get this and I'm gone. Jesus is going to be, or is, how we refer to theologically, as the second Adam. That means that when we put Adam and Jesus side by side, we see that in Jesus comes the reconciliation, the fixing of everything that Adam broke. And one of the differences between the first Adam and the second is that one stayed silent and the other speaks up. It's not just about how they respond in the garden. It's not just about one sinned and one didn't. One of the functions of sin, one of, um, what's the better language for that? One of the conditions that allow for this arrival is that we don't see where Adam converses with Eve. He just lets a conversation with the enemy happen. And I believe historically and theologically we have blamed Eve disproportionately. Well, you know, sin entered the world because of Eve. What if sin entered because of the first sin, which was silence. I wonder what would have happened if Adam had spoke up. I, I wonder what would happen if Adam had said, babe, 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 let's talk about that real quick. I wonder what would happen if Adam had said, babe, you know what? I know it sound like that serpent just kind of made a few points. But let's run this back real quick. What, what if? What if when Adam was handed the fruit, what if he said, are you sure? What would it have been if Adam had said, babe, we better than this. I want to, but we can't. I'm tempted just like you, but I don't think this is the best for us. What if, what if he had said, babe, 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 God has more for us. 
What if he had said, babe, you are too strong and too beautiful and too intelligent to let a serpent dictate what you do? What if Adam had said, babe, you're more than this? You're more than this fruit. You're more than this dumb conversation. You're more than this, and we're more than this. But he said none of that. And Jesus can't make that mistake. Why? Because we need Jesus to be a speaking savior, not a silent one. I promise you, I'm almost done. And then I'm going to pick up part two next week. We need Jesus to be a speaking savior. Do you realize that half the beauty of Jesus' life is what he said? Watch this. The miracles only really matter because of what he said. If you take the miracles without the teaching, what you have is a magic show. The miracles were to help demonstrate and prove what he just taught. Side note, when you're studying scripture, always look at what Jesus preached about before the miracle. Because the miracle is only designed to help us see in real time, tangibly, what Jesus just taught about. All right? The reason why I'm preaching this is because we're celebrating and honoring and having a discussion around women this month. And I believe that Jesus sets a template for us as men that he doesn't just see women, but he identifies and displays how he sees them by what he says to them. I'm not a woman, so I would not dare preach from the experience of one. But what I do know is that men, we must embrace the power of our words and the harm of our silence. It's not enough to see her. You must be conscious about what you say to and about her. I'm saying this as someone who's been tested with this because we're really good, I'm really good at preaching. And I have to hold my feet to the fire to say, do I show up in interpersonal relationships with the multiplicity of women in my life? It's not just about the girl you're dating or the woman you're married to. It's also about how you speak to the woman who works with you who you're not trying to get anything from. Because many women are only familiar with the experience of having someone entreat them with words as a means to get something. For many women, Jesus was the first time they ever experienced an interaction with a man who only came to give. That is one way that Jesus defies the system. Is he always comes to give. He comes to give forgiveness. He comes to give understanding. He comes to give encouragement. He comes to give salvation. He comes to give healing. He always comes to give and to give and to give and to give. But the only thing they understood in that culture was men who came to take because they understood that woman, that's how you've been built in our society is for us to receive and for you to give. But Jesus says, no, if I'm going to be the second Adam, I'm going to flip the script. I came to give, not to receive. And the first place you're going to see that is in how I talk to you and about you. Men, stand with me in this accountability. I'm going to preach something for us about what we need next month. I've already written it. But this Sunday is about us realizing, oh, watch this. It's about us realizing that even we are how we are because of what a man did or didn't say. Many of us Grew up around fathers who were physically present and emotionally absent. And the older I get and the more I study this subject, I almost don't know which one is worse. The absent father physically or the emotionally absent father? Because sometimes that's harder to see someone who you can't connect with. 
And some of us are still trying to get one good job. Love you, mom, but I need to hear my dad say it. I need to hear a man look me in the face and say, I see you, son. Proud of you. Go get it. And what happens is, because we don't ever deal with that, we become the very thing that hurt us. So now we're crying, but still silent, so the cycle continues. We hurt by it, mad, upset, ticked off, but won't break the cycle. We won't look at someone and say, you know what, I see you. I want to show this video. I promise I'm pushed to the end. Next week will be great. I want to provide an example. What is the power of a man's words? And then I'm going to pray. God had to speak over Jesus. So Jesus would be full enough to speak over people, specifically women. Let's look at this clip. Chinese Americans first forced into near slave labor, building our railroads, connecting our country, saw the ugliest of America, but they were going to build their home here and say, America, you may not love me yet, but I'm going to make this nation live up to its promise and hope. LGBTQ Americans from Stonewall women to Seneca. Hidden figures who didn't even get their play until some Hollywood movie finally talked about them and how they were critical for us defying gravity. All of these people loved America. And so you faced insults here that were shocking to me. Well, actually not shocking. But you are here because of that kind of love. And nobody's taken this away from me. So you got five more folk to go through, <laughs> five more of us. And then you can sit back and let us have all the debates. And I'm going to tell you, it's going to be a well-charted Senate floor because it's not going to stop. They're going to accuse you of this and that. Heck, in honor of your person who shares your birthday, you might be called a communist. But don't worry, my sister. Don't worry. God has got you. And how do I know that? Because you're here. And I know what it's taken for you to sit in that seat. Chinese Americans first forced into near. Now confirm Supreme Court Justice. Sat in that seat and endured days and days and hours of people who at that moment didn't see her as a human being. They saw her as a prop. My favorite part about that whole hearing is that there was a moment where I realized this is not about her. It's a peeing contest. I was gonna say something else. But so that these people can take advantage of this moment to speak past her and excite whoever their base is on either side. I'm not attacking one side or the other. I'm saying the whole thing became a circus around what people wanted to prove from their own camp. They weren't talking to her. They were talking to their base on the other side of her. And I wonder how many women in the Bible and today knew that experience. Where conversations weren't even about them. This is fascinating to me about when the Pharisees and religious rulers catch the woman in adultery. And I think catch is a fascinating word because you didn't catch her, y'all was spying. So we should probably have a conversation about why you were so comfortable being a voyeur and claim to be men of God. It's not about her sin. They want to trip up Jesus. And she's the prop to do that. Could you imagine? And Jesus says, let's break all that. This brother, Senator Booker, inspired me. And what you believe about politics aside, I'm not talking about where he stands politically or where anybody stands politically. I'm talking about the courage to break a moment and say, my words have power. 
And to look at someone who does not share your experience, specifically a woman, and choose to speak words that affirm, that protect, and can I tell you the one I'm not good at yet? Words that defend. I want to be seen as cool by other men as I grow into my manhood. So there have been times where I didn't speak up when I should because I was concerned about how the other men would view me. So although I knew it was wrong, I couldn't afford to lose cool points. Why? Because I'm still struggling in my own definition of manhood. And I'm willing to admit that to you at 28 years old. I'm still trying to find out what that means. And sometimes I look to things that may or may not be God to enforce that. And what that does is that pushes me into silence. But he didn't care. He said, I don't care what you other people think about me. You can call me whatever you want. You can say I was pandering. You can call me a simp. You can say I was whack. You can, you can question whatever you want. I have to stand in this moment and know that it's just me and her. Put up that side by side. Look at his passion. Look at his conviction and look at her response at the first opportunity to be seen where every other second of the day she was just a prop. That someone, that, that Judge Katanji Brown Jackson, who for that whole hearing had been the most composed I've seen anybody ever. She did not flinch. She said what she had to say. She knew it. She had prepared for so many days and months. But the one thing that made her come undone was the words of a black man. God said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. God called Jesus his son so that Jesus could refer to women as daughters. Jesus gave what he was full of. So I invite you with me to be accountable. I don't care how old you are. I don't care how many mistakes you've made. I need you to know, black man, that what you say matters and your silence matters. If you tune in next week, part two is I'm gonna teach you how this works. I'm literally gonna lay it out. I'm telling you this is my life's work. Why? Because y'all know I don't do nothing else but talk. If there's anything that I have a half degree of knowledge about, it's not just talking but about how to say things. And I've realized many of us struggle sometimes because we just don't wanna do it, we're afraid, but many of us struggle because we've never seen it. We actually don't know the sentence. And if that's you, I'm coming to help you next week. I rely on y'all for, for fitness, and some of you all I look up to for how you run businesses. I, I think the way and, and the, the length and breadth of Brother David Sr.'s experience in business is something I look up to from a manhood perspective. I think what Brother Peter has done in marriage and in, in, in child rearing and Pastor Byron, I look up to so many of these men for what they've done in manhood. I think one of the things I offer in this equation is I'm familiar with how to hold conversation. And if you do it well, and if you do it intentionally, it can change the game. Bow your heads. <sighs> God, I thank you for being a speaking God. I thank you that I don't have to guess how you feel don't have to guess what you think about me. I don't have to guess what your perspective or plan is. You've spoken so much that you've laid out your mind and your heart and your plan for me clearly. I'm asking that you would help me as a growing man and help the other man in this room to realize that our words are more powerful than we think. 
and that if we're going to follow you, it won't just be about not smoking or drinking or whatever we think the, the works of holiness are. It will also be following how you talk to people, how we talk to our bros, how we talk to our children, how we talk to our mothers, sisters, wives, girlfriends, and help us to speak to them in ways that allow us to prove that we see them because when we do that, we give you glory. We can't do that though if we don't first receive what you spoke over us. Fill our cups so we have it to give. In Jesus' name, amen. Brother Johnny's coming for our Sila moment and then I have brunch reservations. <laughs> going to a new place, very excited today. They have lemon ricotta pancakes. That's what I'm gonna order. And I'm ordering something else because I believe you should order both. Don't, don't think about it. Jesus would have had both, but that's different theology. I'll teach you that next week. Come on, Brother Johnny. Praise God for Brother Johnny and our Sila service moment. Good morning. Woo. Well, as you can see, I have notes upon notes <laughs> upon notes and um, several questions. But before I ask this question, I really would like to share with you the words that you said and how it hit home with me. Because my father and I, we weren't really that close. And um, he was one of those fathers that you mentioned that was present physically, but absent emotionally. And... Um, he was that way until, until I actually graduated college. He was very absent emotionally until, he, until I graduated college. And then, I don't know, something changed in him, which is nothing but a blessing that I appreciate. But I found that it, it hit me generationally. Because when I had my son, or when Linda had him, but <laughs> um, you love your child when they're a baby and two years old and three years old and you tell them, oh, I love you and all this other stuff. But once I noticed myself that once he got to the age of, I say consciousness, okay? I found myself becoming more of a disciplinarian versus the loving portion right. where you don't really express, hey son, I love you. Hey, I appreciate all you do and things like that. And, it, and I, I noticed that. Linda and I have had conversations about this and I, I actually am glad that one day I did, you know, just speak to him and tell him, you know, hey, it's not because of what you're doing in school or anything. I just love you. Yeah. I love you for you. I love you. Don't, don't try to prove anything, right? right? Like uh, God said that he loved Jesus before Jesus did anything. Yeah. Yeah. And that was the emotion that I shared with him. So I really appreciate you bringing that up. Um, I have three really good questions that I want to ask, but I don't want to prolong it, so I'm just going to cut it down to two. Okay. Okay. In the beginning, when you uh, were referring to Matthew 3, 13 through 17, and you said, well, Jesus said, it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. I just was hoping that you could possibly expand on why was it proper for this to happen this particular way? It's a great, great, great question, great question. So at the beginning of that text, when they're having this, this discussion about whether or not John the Baptist will baptize Jesus, what I love about Jesus is that he filters everything he does by what should happen for the scripture to be fulfilled. So that's what I love is even though Jesus is going to, um, even though the work of Jesus will introduce the New Testament, or as we see it, the new covenant, Jesus, first of all, has to see himself as a part of the old one. And what I love is that when we see Jesus in that way, we don't do a few things. Number one, we don't separate Jesus from his Jewishness. Like Jesus didn't disavow Judaism to bring about Christianity. The Bible says, remember when Jesus says this, I didn't come to destroy the law, but I came to fulfill it. So he's saying, I didn't come to just put a break and do my own thing. He says, it is good for me to be a part of the law or it is good for me to be a part of this process. 
And Jesus being baptized by John the Baptist and submitting to that part of the process was right and good for him to do so. And so I think it's important for us to remember that Jesus is not acting as an island. He's acting within the same things that we read throughout the Old Testament. Jesus goes to feast days. He goes to temple. He has all these practices because he has to fulfill the law of God perfectly. And that also means that a bunch of stuff he didn't do because he felt like it. He just knew, I have to do this so that scripture's fulfilled. So that's what that means. Okay, thank you. Um, the other question I had when you uh, mentioned that God can do more work with a humble person versus a talented one. And I was thinking, well, you know, a talented person, you know, they already have, you know, their, their brand out there. They already, their name is out there. People recognize them. People listen to them because they're, quote, unquote, a talented person, you know. So, but you said God can do more with a humble person. Can you expand a little bit more on that? The one difference is that one realizes their need for God and the other one doesn't. When we are talented and believe that we will get places because of that talent, now you start doing what you can do. And the only fruit for doing what you can do is just what you get out of doing you. But when you operate and say, I'm going to do me, I'm going to be faithful, I'm going to do what's in my responsibility, but I realize that none of that is anything without God, that's when God, that's why we have scriptures like this, where the Bible says, humble yourself and I will exalt you, right? Where, where, where um, scripture teaches us that promotion doesn't come from the east or from the west, but it comes from the spirit of God. And so talent is great, and the Lord uses talent, but what ultimately makes us successful long-term is when we realize, number one, let's, let's start here. I ain't even talented because of me. I'm talented because he gave it. So who I look like, thinking I can build something off the talent when the talent's not even mine to begin with. But second of all, you can, we can accomplish so much more when we live like, God, I need you. One, one of the concepts, and, and again, I know that different people in the house might fall different places theologically. Um, but one of the things that's essential to our faith is realizing that we are nothing without God. One of the concepts for, for my reformed brothers and sisters is called total depravity. Like, I am nothing. I have nothing without God. And so I think when you live from that place, God's able to be like, let me fill you, let me use you, let me do, because now, and I'll put it this way and then, then I'll end. When we live by talent, then we just live by talent. But when we live by reliance on God, I get talent and everything God has. When I walk with God, I'm using everything in me and then everything that's above me. And that creates a whole different pattern for success. Ask your last question, and then, and then we're going to brunch. Okay, appreciate it, appreciate it, because I, was, I really yeah, yeah, wanted yeah. to ask hit, this hit last the question. One, hit the third one. Um, this last question I was going to ask is, can you give us some suggestions on how we can focus more on the right voice to listen to? The seven voices that you gave us were amazing, but how can we know which voice to listen to? How can we focus more on the right voice? couple of things. Number one, remember everything should start and end with what God said. So if you aren't aware about what God has said over you, you and I, we are more susceptible to what we hear. So what I would recommend, if you're looking for a Bible study to do, I would, would highlight and look for scriptures where God is speaking to either a group like Israel or an individual person and saying, you are blah, blah, blah. Okay. Now, a little studying note, don't just take a random scripture where God says you are and then be like, this is what he said. Do the study around it, right? So you can see context, my refresh and chill fam. Remember, we wanna study that context and see who was God talking to and, and how much of this can I appropriate for myself. Some of it is just a copy paste, right? Others we wanna be careful, we wanna say, maybe God was speaking to a particular situation, but you gotta start there. Number two, you should surround yourself with people who are what I call echoes of God. I believe in all of our lives, we need echoes of God's voice. And that's what I'm gonna talk about next week. How can we in our conversation be echoes of the voice of God to the people who are close to us? I think you need that. Number three, I am learning the importance of time alone. Part of our problem is we just hear too much. 
And I'm learning that the secret now to my study time is quiet time. Even before I go figure out how many 80 different interpretations of a scripture there are, I just sit in the darkness in silence because I move so fast and I hear so much, I sit in silence. And literally, you have to let those thoughts filter. Now, the other half of that is we have to get comfortable saying to ourselves what God has said about us. I have an actual practice where I look in the mirror and I have to tell Princeton all the things Princeton doesn't naturally believe in himself. You know what, Princeton, you do look good. You certainly put on some COVID weight, but you, you holding the weight well for what, for what you got going on. I have to look at Princeton without the hairline and say, you know what? This hairline is backsliding, but you still anointed. have to I because here's my mentor Jonathan Sprinkles taught me this he said confidence is this confidence is confiding in yourself so confidence is what you say to yourself about yourself so you you and I we can't be so busy being mad at what someone did or did not say that we don't take control over the conversation in our own head we have to be gentler with our own conversation, and ultimately that will reflect God. So more tips, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end there. That's it. Thank you. Come on, praise God for Brother Johnny. Come on, humble pursuit. Let's get out of here. Everybody stand. Were you blessed today? Oh, man. Love you so much. We'll be back next week. Um, everybody stand. I don't even know how to end this. <laughs> oh. Father, thank you. Um, for your time and for your power in this service. We give you glory and honor and praise in Jesus' name. When all those fails, when you don't know nothing, write nothing. You're gonna be in the write something. You're gonna be hands on the ushers. We'll see y'all next week. Thank you, Pastor Jay, for those incredible announcements. I believe what you said about me. I believe what you said about me. I believe what you said about me. I believe what you said about everybody. Say